Welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point and Li Xin. In this series, I'll dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join us in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email me at the point with LX at cgtn.com. Let me know your thoughts. We start our live streaming every Friday at uh, 11 a.m. Beijing time, so get in touch and we just might read out your comments. This week, we are looking at media coverage on the proposed decision to enact a national security law for Hong Kong. Is it fair? Do the articles give the big picture what's missing? Before we get to the headlines, a bit of background first. A decision was passed by China's top legislature, the National People's Congress, almost unanimously on Thursday, April the, on Thursday, May the 28th. It aims to establish and improve the legal system and enforcement mechanisms for the Hong Kong SAR to safeguard national security, to change the long-term defenselessness of the city in this regard. Now, the need for such a law resurfaced in the second half of last year when the city was plagued by protests sparked by the proposal of a now withdrawn fugitive bill but undermined by some Hong Kongers deep-seated concerns over threats to their freedoms the protests began peacefully but escalated quickly some protesters started rioting damaging public property committing arsons vandalizing shops making weapons like petrol bombs and attacking police officers and in some cases ordinary people with opposing views Hong Kong's economy took a hit and many residents didn't feel safe leaving their homes. A city renowned for its cosmopolitan openness and prosperity was consumed by chaos. It was a scary time for law-abiding citizens who called the city home. Now, part of what makes Hong Kong special is the one country, two systems principle introduced as the city was handed over to Chinese rule after being a British colony from 1841 to 1997. Under the principle, Hong Kong has its own mini constitution called the Basic Law and in that constitution is Article 23 which says the city must enact a national security law to prohibit treason, secession, sedition, subversion against the Chinese government. But for 23 years since 1997, that law has yet to materialize. After the city was gripped by unprecedented level of violence last year, many believe it's high time for the law to be enacted so that people who threaten China's national security through Hong Kong will face more serious consequences. And since the Hong Kong SAR has not been able to pass the law, China's top legislature decided to step in. Is it legal? Well, there are relevant provisions in both China's constitution and Hong Kong's basic law which allow for national laws on matters above Hong Kong's autonomy to be applied to the city. Is it necessary? The answer for many who have suffered from the violence, from the disturbances, from the destruction is a clear yes. From the central government's perspective, to do nothing and let the violence continue would be irresponsible. Some people in Hong Kong see this as a potential infringement on their rights, as the central government chipping away at their freedoms. While well-founded concerns could be understandable and there needs to be some kind of process of bringing people together from different sides, violence is clearly not the answer. But when you look at how many Western media reports are covering this topic, a lot of this new ones is missing. The context has been swept under the carpet and the focus is on fear and perceived loss of freedom. Today we'll look at just a few examples and fill out the rest of the picture. First up is a May 21st article from The Guardian. This is the end of Hong Kong. China pushes controversial security laws. The stance here is quite blatant. The headline frames the issue by using a quote from the opposition that's provocative, yes, but fair, 
No. The subhead doesn't bother to give the broader context or any other side of the story. Instead, it piles on the same opinion saying proposed legislation would effectively end one country, two system status, say critics. The article adds condemnation of the proposal was swift amid fear it could erase the one country, two systems framework that is supposed to grant the territory a high degree of autonomy. Among quotes from a, a total of 10 different sources there are who are against the bill, there is just one voice from China's central government, a spokesperson from the National People's Congress who says, quote, national security is the bedrock underpinning the stability of the country. So 10 versus 1. What the article fails to point out also is that the decision only targets a narrow category of acts and behaviours that uh, jeopardise national security and is clearly written in the approved decision to uphold and improve on the one country, two systems. But this fact is missing from the Guardian report. And uh, if you have watched other media reports, you will find a large number of voices which support the bill. These people do not see the bill as the end of Hong Kong, but the beginning of a new hopeful chapter for the city. And these opinions come from many who have lived in the city for many years, Chinese and foreigners alike. They're not giving a voice in this article of uh, The Guardian. So where is due impartiality here? Up next is a news article from Bloomberg. On May the 22nd, the headline reads, China dares Trump to hit back with Hong Kong power grab. The article starts with, on the first day of China's biggest political event of the year, Xi Jinping sent a clear message to Donald Trump. We are going to do what we want in Hong Kong and we are not scared of the consequences. Well, that's imaginative and rather dramatic, but unfortunately missing the point. What China does is for China's legitimate good, not to play into anybody else's intrigue. And although we take President Trump very seriously, the new law was not designed with him in mind. He's got enough to deal with as it is. The article also claims, for Xi, the move allows Beijing to reassert dominance over a piece of Chinese territory where his government was rendered impotent during sometimes violent protests last year. Way off the mark again. The central government has been respecting with utmost restraint the one country, two systems principle and letting the city manage the situation on its own. Beijing had clearly other options but refrained from using any. However, that seems to have been taken as a sign of weakness or impotence. To prevent more chaos and uh, further destruction to the city, Beijing has decided it has to take more proactive steps. In a way, those who have been pushing the limits invited this move. The Bloomberg article then lists a whole array of ways US President Donald Trump might retaliate if the bill is passed. This is a typical example of the navel-gazing so prolific in many Western media outlets. For many in the West, the only way to understand issues in China is through the prism of their own construction. That's not always going to work. Our next ex example features a different take. A May 23rd South China Morning Post headline reads, Two Sessions 2020 Hong Kong National Security Law will only target small group of people, Vice Premier Han Zheng says as Beijing hits back at critics. Here we see a bit of the nuance missing in some other reports. Not the end of Hong Kong as we know it, but rather more balanced coverage that uh, features multiple sides of the same story. For example, a quote from Vice Premier Han Zheng while speaking to Beijing's uh, uh, top political advisory body that says, the law will plug a legal loophole exposed by violent anti-government protests in the city and will not affect the livelihood of ordinary citizens. But the article also looks at the other side of the story, some of the concerns from the Hong Kong people, for example, when it talks about the possibility that intelligence agencies might be set up by Beijing in the city under the National Security Bill. It quotes the convener of the opposition bloc in the legislature as saying such agencies will be above Hong Kong's law. That's his opinion, of course. So voices from critics and supporters alike are represented in the article and it does a fair job 
job of explaining the complexities involved in keeping China, including Hong Kong, safe while respecting the one country, two systems principle. It is a sensitive issue, yes, but it's also important to understand the background and wider context to the issue, rather than just zero in on one side of the story. That's the end of my monologue, but the live streaming will continue right after this short break, where I have three guests from the mainland, from the United States, and from Hong Kong joining us to share their opinions. Stay with me. A move that's set to safeguard security and peaceful development of Hong Kong. The vice chairman of the NPC Standing Committee says it is time to draft relevant laws. Article 23 of the Basic Law of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region stipulates that the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall enact laws on its own to prohibit any act of treason, secession, sedition, subversion against the Central People's Government, or theft of state secrets. It also prohibits foreign political organizations or bodies from conducting political activities in the city and prohibits political organizations or bodies of Hong Kong from establishing ties with foreign political organizations or bodies. Hong Kong was thrown into chaos last year as protests began escalating in June against a proposed fugitive bill. Violent protesters burned public facilities, attacked civilians, police and officials. Some openly disfaced the national flag and attacked the central government's liaison office. Both central and Hong Kong authorities condemned the violence, saying that the destruction was backed by those with ulterior motives. After more than seven months of chaos, the draft decision to impose security laws in Hong Kong is seen as a strong reply at the legislative level. Wang Chen said the move aimed to safeguard national security, uphold and improve the one country, two systems principle, and oppose external interference. The draft decision stressed the basic principles, detailing that Hong Kong must complete the security legislation, improve security enforcement, and regularly report to the central government regarding the issue. Once as if the motion passes, the Standing Committee will begin working with relevant parties to draft appropriate laws. Dakai CGTN. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Headline Buster. I'm Liu Xin in Beijing, and uh, we are pleased to be joined by three guests from the mainland Hong Kong and the United States, respectively. In Hong Kong, we have Whitman Hoon, who is a deputy to the 13th National People's Congress, China's top legislator. We have uh, Wang Tsung, chief reporter from Global Times, and we have Aina Tangan, a current affairs commentator. So, gentlemen, welcome to the point. Uh, Aina is not there for the moment. So let me start with uh, Mr. Hung. It's been a while. Haven't seen you for a while. So it's good to have you on the show. So we were talking about this Guardian article, which it was entitled uh, The Death of Hong Kong, Beijing Passes a Controversial National Security Bill. How do you think it is possible that a respected British newspaper would publish something, uh, would pass something which is clearly a heavy loaded opinion piece as a news article and under such a very much polarized title, clearly stating one side of the opinion? Whitman. Well, uh, this is nothing new. Um, if you remember, there was a very famous uh, uh, cover article on the Fortune in 1995, which said uh, the death of Hong Kong. And in 2018, there was an article on the Fortune again, um, saying the death of Hong Kong uh, came late, but uh, still sure. Uh, that's when uh, Hong Kong's local government was banning on the Hong Kong National Party. 
So there's nothing new. There's the, the Western media had always this, I don't know, it's, it's something in the deep in their mind that uh, since uh, Hong Kong had been handed over back to the uh, Chinese state, it should die. Whether they, you know, whether it's 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 uh, a reality or whether it's just something of out of their wishful thinking, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, the the, the God obviously didn't in the so far in voting. Um, you know, uh, yesterday <laughs> I just came back from Beijing yesterday. So if you listen to the applause after this. Um, motion was passed in the uh, people's uh, hall the, there was a pause for almost 45 seconds almost longer than the one after the premier's uh, annual report so you know it's you now widely supported by all the deputies uh, you know all over china i mean if you look at it well, when there was a reporter who asked me how i felt i said i, I heard the voice of 1.4 billion people you know, yeah, indeed. Uh, Hong Kong's matter is not just a matter of the 7.4 million, it's the matter of 1.4 billion. I mean, that is something for sure. I mean, what is it? Uh, I mean, the Guardian didn't say it's the death of Hong Kong, they said this is the end of Hong Kong. I think it's to a certain extent it's true. It's the end of Hong Kong as a hub for global intelligence activities. It's the end of Hong Kong as a basis for secession and subversion against the Chinese national government. And or maybe it is now the time the end of Hong Kong as a battlefield of terrorists against police and ordinary citizens in that you know in that sense I may I agree it is the end of Hong Kong in that particular you know um, position or matter that's a very interesting way to look at it uh, Wang Tsung let me get uh, your perspective uh, clearly if you're respected international publication you need to be very careful of what you say if you tell people that uh, what they are reading is represents the opinion of the great majority of the people either uh, in the China in China as a whole or in Hong Kong you have to be uh, very careful you know you have to base that on reality and yet for instance from what Whitman was talking about this long time applause I also noticed that and it was very much than the news why is are the pictures so different you know if you just read what's reported on Hong Kong from outside in the West you will feel that this is a decision imposed on the will of the people of Hong Kong against the will of the people of China whereas actually the picture is very much different yeah Liu Xin, nice to see you by the way uh, two words, sensationalism and bias I mean uh, when you read the uh, story the headline end of Hong Kong, you know, it rhymes with the end of the world. So they are clearly uh, trying to click some, uh, like trying to bait some clicks and get some attention. We're talking about it here, right? So uh, that's uh, that's what it is with fear mongering headlines. Uh, Hong Kong is not uh, ending uh, by uh, literally, I think, uh, not will end, it will not end with the national security law. It will not end with any type of sanction the U.S. can take including scrapping the economic special treatment. It will not end anyway. Uh, and uh, like, uh, like the deputy said, uh, if their version uh, of Hong Kong is about violence and riot, the end of that, I think, is the good thing. It's, that is exactly what the national security law uh, is aiming at, ending that version of Hong Kong. And uh, getting back to the uh, broader uh, foreign media coverage of this national security law, I mean, there's... Uh, a unbelievable level of bias uh, towards this. They uh, stir up controversy. Uh, they stir up manufacturing concern and then call the law controversial. Uh, it's, it is not controversial because you can uh, go look at the voting uh, yesterday at the NPC close, uh, closing. It is not controversy, uh, controversial in any way uh, when it comes to the procedure of the law's passing. Uh, they uh, apply the toughest scrutiny to everything China does with regards to uh, in affairs in Hong Kong, but they doesn't uh, uh, apply any none to what their officials and the governments say or do. Uh, worse, they're advocating for it, like the Bloomberg uh, piece. Uh, they're actually trying to uh, tell a U.S. president, knowing for erratic, uh, emotional, uh, uh, I think uh, 
decision making that China is hitting back at you. So you have to hit back with all these uh, countermeasures, all these sanctions that we have listed in this article. So that is uh, where we at uh, in terms of this media coverage. Uh, and in China, I think, I mean, the national security law, it, it cannot be easier to understand the name says it, national security, and it targets four specific uh, actions, uh, specific right. kind actions. It yeah. will not end anything. So that, that okay. is where we are, bias. Yeah. Well, it is interesting because when I was talking about the Bloomberg article, it is interesting. They actually uh, imagined what uh, President Xi uh, meant to be sending as a message to President Trump. President Xi didn't say that. They, they make that up and they, you know, made that news article. It's, it's really bewildering to me. How can media organizations do that and uh, to click baits, to, to bait clicks, but they're already very, very popular. What is the aim of doing that? Uh, Whitman, would you have any explain, possible explanation to that? Uh, I don't because I don't know them, but I think, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, you know a conspiracy, a conspiracy uh, theories and people like to speculate, uh, uh, you know, play one against another uh, and, and, and the story sounds, you know, sounds, sounds interesting, sounds exciting. That's probably why. Um, in fact, if just like what you rightly pointed out during uh, your monologue, you know, uh, the matter is purely a Chinese internal matter and the national security has always been the power of the central government. It has never been delegated to the SAR government. So in this particular case, yes, there was a, um, there was a clause in the uh, basic law, Article 23, where yeah. uh, they asked the SAR to, to create its own law. But for 23 years has passed, I mean, and we see it very clearly with the current turmoil and the current legislature in Hong Kong, this law wouldn't be passed in the near future, while at the same time, Hong Kong becomes the weakest link in the whole Chinese national security, which is why then the national government have you know, no choice to, uh, but to, you know, uh, take up its responsibility and as a final yeah. duty to ensure I that the security of the state has been protected. Yeah. I want to focus still on the role of the media and uh, the impact of media's job. For instance, this uh, due impartiality is a very important uh, keyword, and I think it is a struggle. It is a lofty goal for every media organization. And yes, and yet if you look at the Guardian report, for instance, uh, 10 voices against the bill versus uh, just one is not even a... a, a an interviewee, it's a soundbite taken from one of the MPC deputies to, um, used as some kind of voice in support of this bill. So what is due impartiality? It is a big deal, I understand that, and I think it, is, it not, must be upheld. And yet, in this case, in The Guardian's case, do they meet the requirement of due impartiality? And, and yet, I'm not hearing anything, I'm not seeing anything where they are being scrutinized on that, at least on that particular issue. Uh, Wang Tsong, please. Well, <coughs> that's right. I mean, uh, this uh, goes way back to all this, uh, you know, since the uh, unrest started in Hong Kong. Of course, you know, we're, we in the media, uh, that's what we strive for. That's what media does in partiality. You, you have to make all the efforts, it is hard to, you know, to be completely uh, impartial when it comes to, uh, especially under this uh, current political environment, uh, that there's so much tension, dispute going on between China and the West. It is hard. However, uh, that doesn't mean that we don't try, we don't make any efforts to... Uh, okay, it seems... Uh, yeah. To be animal. why can't interview someone like Mr. Hong, right? You, there, there are tens of people on uh, in on the mainland on social media. You can't. Uh, why can't uh, interview one of them and put a more balanced headline uh, in the in the you know in the headline and also on the content in the content? So I think uh, they just don't even try. That's the problem. It's not the problem about how hard the job is. The problem is that they don't try. 
Whitman, what is your comment uh, yes. sitting in Hong Kong? Have you been approached, for instance, well, by international media getting your p feedback on the spill or s related issues? No. Uh, well, I did, I did uh, been posted by the South China Morning Post. Uh, I wouldn't call that uh, necessarily a uh, you know, international media. No, I have not been approached. Uh, I do read the Guardians every now and then, and sometimes I like what they write. But I think uh, with all due respect, um, impartiality is probably too much to ask these day and age, you uh, know. I'm sorry to say that, but you know, if you look at all the media's report on the Hong Kong uh, incidents for the past, you know, less than a year, uh, and also in day-to-day -day life, when we look at how the Western media look at what the Chinese does, I mean, it has been beyond one's imagination. I mean, I, I, from what I learned, though, is that um, the, 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 the universities, when they teach uh, journalism uh, these days, they, people are talking about, you know, advocacy journalism instead of facts. Um, so. If that has been taught to our reporters, I mean, that's what's going to happen. I, I don't like it, but I think that's the, just the fact that these in age, I remember there was a, I can't remember who said that, there's a person who, who was an old BBC guy uh, some time ago. He said, opinion is cheap, you know, facts, uh, you know, the, the truth is, is more precious. Um, you know, I couldn't remember the exact wording, but this an age we are so used to facing all these cheap opinions that disguise itself as news. Um, I'm just getting used to it. Yeah, well, it is a difficult issue and uh, we're also in it. I mean, including this program that you're watching and including many of the things that I produce, maybe not on TV on a daily basis, but a lot of opinion pieces I'm churning out as well. Uh, it is a universal challenge. What makes the difference between cheap opinion and not cheap opinion. Whitman, again. No, I, I, I think all, all opinions are respected, but cheap. Okay. <laughs> because everyone has <laughs> his own opinion. You know, everyone has their own opinion and we respect that. Um, but I think what is really important, uh, impartiality is hard to ask, but at least we should show the facts. Okay? Yeah. Facts, that, you know, that the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I mean, this is the thing when I learned when I, when I was a kid, and this day and age, that seems to be too much to ask to our media, and that is mm. really very sad. Okay. Well, at least if you are giving your opinion, you have to tell people that this is opinion. So this could be cheap, or let them judge whether it is cheap or, or not so cheap, but uh, not pass it as pure facts or pure news report. Wang Song, yes. what is your take? What is your take on this? Well, like you said, you know, uh, I'm very much in this also uh, because this is uh, type. This is the type of issues that we cover. Uh, we have to be very, very careful. Uh, you know, uh, div uh, uh, d differentiate distinct uh, opinion from uh, facts. Uh, there are a lot of facts when it comes to uh, covering uh, national security law. You know, legislations like this because uh, basically the news is about reactions to this national security law. Uh, so. Uh, but still, you can. Uh, there's uh, clear journalistic uh, skills standards uh, that you can apply. Uh, that trying to make sure that the piece, uh, even if it's an opinion piece, it's balanced. There's always a way uh, to this. You know, I studied the journalism in the United States. That's what we uh, what we were taught, and that's uh, there. There's a lot of uh, ways. I, I just think that I don't want to be okay. thinking that. Uh, in saying that this is a hard job, but, you know, uh, there's ways to do it. And uh, what saddens me is that Western journalism, which, you know, which they claim to be free and independent, objective, uh, when, uh, they, they are not when it comes to Hong Kong and, and, and China. They, this is the topics I know. This is what I cover and mm -hmm. what they're saying. Okay. Uh, they don't differentiate opinion from facts and their yeah. uh, opinions. Some opinions are uh, sound if it's based on facts, yeah. reason, uh, but other opinions are cheap. It's quite easy to, uh, to differentiate, I think, from the uh, reader's uh, perspective well, as well. 
Yeah, well, I think it is uh, possible to have uh, opinion that's based more on facts, more sound. But uh, for the poor consumer of all kinds of information, at this day and age, it is very diff difficult to differentiate between uh, quality information, between quality opinion and uh, um, fake information or disinformation. I'm told that Ina is finally able to join me. Let me try to get to Ina's perspective. Uh, Ina if you're there, um, please say hi. I'm not seeing you yet. Hello. Hi oh, there. You're, I've yeah, been good, listening good. to the conversation with interest. <laughs> good. So, yeah, so, um, so yeah. tell us about yeah, your perspective on this uh, impartiality issue. It seems to be, it is a very important challenge. I acknowledge it. And we are not always up to par, I guess, and everybody. And yet it seems that it is not just a Chinese problem. Uh, Aina, what is your take? Well, there are legitimate con uh, concerns and discussions that need to be had when you have any type of change. That's the role of journalism. But you can't go in with the idea that I'm, uh, I'm going to hang these people, uh, but we'll just have a trial for show or we'll have no trial. And that, that I think, is, is really what is at stake here. Uh, I would agree with uh, my fellow commentators to the extent that uh, journalistic in integrity is absolutely essential to the role of the fourth estate, especially in uh, democratic societies. But it, it's not given here. And part of that is there's a kind of hostility of journalism towards uh, you know, the communist system in party, I mean, in China, simply because they don't see a role for themselves. And therefore, they see it antagonistically. They say that you know, the so press is, it, is not yeah, is it the same possible? way. Yeah. Is it possible, Aina, because they don't see us as uh, sim similar animals uh, because of a different ideology, ideological system? So when it comes to China, they don't have to respect these rules, Aina. Do you think there is a possibility of that element in there? Well, a absolutely. And you, you, you see this in a, in a lot of respects. There is this incredulity that somehow you know, Huawei could actually master a technology uh, and be on the leading edge, not just a few months ahead, but a year and a half ahead. You had the same thing with uh, COVID-19. Uh, the assumption was that Vaccine. anything that China could do, yeah. uh, yes, anything that China could do in terms of containing the virus, the West could do better, or democratic countries, I shouldn't say West, democratic countries could do better. Now, that has been proven to be uh, uh, disproven. Western liberal democratic uh, societies can do better. Let me put it this way. <laughs> Yes, and, and this is the problem, that you're, you're seeing this kind of widening gap, this uh, desire to uh, stereotype, quote, the other side. There's yeah. not real discussion. And unfortunately, the press is l the leading edge of this. They're uh, competing with okay. social media and trying yeah. to outdo it rather than think and get uh, balanced sources. They're jumping to the headline. Well, we are, we all have this pressure. Media. We all have this pressure to survive yes. in this new, new media age, right? But finally, I know, very briefly, how do you look at this tendency in the U.S. media to always look at Chinese issues through the prism of the American narrative or American construction, for instance, that what China does is to provoke President Trump or to, um, you know, to dare President Trump of whatever potential consequences? How do you look at that? Very briefly. Aina. Well, okay. unfortunately, it's a yeah. uh, situation where people are not able are not able to look at both sides, and and that is what the journalists are supposed to do. And unfortunately, they're failing in that. All right. Well, we hope our discussion will help uh, to a certain degree for people to see the bigger picture. And it's always a reminder for us to do as good a job as possible. Many thanks to my three guests. Uh, Whitman Hon joining us from Hong Kong. Wang Song joining us from Global Times. And Aina Tangen joining us also from Beijing. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Headline Buster brought to you by The Point with me, Liu Xin. Uh, as always, follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with Alex next Friday at the same time. We'll join you or join us rather on live streaming and on TV. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.